The year was 1913. Woodrow Wilson was president, and powerful banking interests, who had been trying for years, finally achieved their long-term goal of a silent coup d'etat by taking control of the American government. The first thing they did to accomplish their takeover was convince Secretary of State Philander Knox to lie to the American people and tell them that the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, had been legally ratified by the states when it was not. The bankers knew that this tax would ultimately end up in their pockets. Because of this fraud, the American people were led to believe there was now a tax on their labor. Congress and the president are completely aware of this fraud, and it was even cited in a recent court case. That very same year, the bankers committed their second and by far the most diabolical fraud ever perpetrated on the American people by bribing senators to pass the Federal Reserve Act without the required constitutional amendment. All in favor say aye. They did this during Christmas vacation, where many senators were home celebrating the holidays with their families. And that's how the unconstitutional Federal Reserve Act came into being. They were very clever, and they understood that whoever issued the money for America would control the government. The bankers won, and the American people lost, because most politicians will sell their soul for a dollar. And now the Federal Reserve could issue dollars legally. As Mayor Rothschild said, give me control of a nation's money supply, and I care not who makes its laws. He knew that he and the other bankers would now control the laws of the nation. Government gave these bankers one of its most important powers and now had to borrow money from them and pay interest to finance the government. So the American people were forced to lower their standard of living and pay a graduated income tax to the government just so the government could give these bankers more profits. President Woodrow Wilson who signed the Federal Reserve Act into law, later said, in regret, I am a most unhappy man. I have unwittingly ruined my country. A great industrial nation is now controlled by its system of credit. We are no longer a government by free opinion, no longer a government by conviction and the vote of the majority, but a government by the opinion and duress of a small group of dominant men. The Federal Reserve was created by Congress in 1913, and it was entrusted with the power granted originally to the Congress by the U.S. Constitution to coin money and regulate the value thereof. What's your name? Jan Crafting. Hi, Jan. I'm Aaron Russo. I produced the movie Trade. Is this a joke? Am I gonna no, no, that's not a joke. Okay, no, 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 no. I produced the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and the Rose with Bette Midler, many movies. I'm doing a feature film, and uh, my film is about my quest to find out whether or not people pay income taxes. Do you pay an income tax? Yes, I do. You do. Yeah. Have you ever seen a law that requires you to pay an income tax? Have I ever read it? Do you mean in the page, black and white? No, yeah. no. So you pay the income tax, I assume? Uh, of late. Well, actually, no, I didn't file last year, but... Uh, okay. so I'm sorry, is this on film? No, I paid my tax. You, my, my question to you is, have you ever seen a law that says you have to pay an income tax? The 
law is that guy that can't wear that badge and a gun. That's the one that puts you in jail. That's the law. Actually, I can't stand the IRS. Okay. They're right. evil. Okay. Do you have any fear of the IRS? Um, not, not really, because I'm Canadian. I think it's actually unconstitutional, is what I've heard. Right. But, um, but to avoid any hassle, I pay it. If there was no law and I wasn't afraid of them coming and taking me to jail, absolutely, I wouldn't pay taxes. Okay, then no, I wouldn't pay income taxes. Oh. It's a no-brainer. You wouldn't pay I it. wouldn't pay it. Why would anybody? Because they, you know, that's, that's what they tell us we must do, else we're bad Americans. Would you pay it? No. Would you pay it? No. So Why would you pay taxes if you don't have to? What if I told you that the, all your money that the income tax pay, that's paid into the income tax, just goes to pay the interest on the national debt. That's incredible. That's yeah. truly incredible. I thought it was for infrastructure and all the other stuff. The income tax is not legal because it would be a direct tax and it is not apportioned as the Constitution demands. If it's against the Constitution, then why are we doing it? I really expected that, of course, there's a law that you can point to in the law book, the code, that requires you to file a tax return. Of course there is. I mean, I don't know what it is right then as, we, as he was speaking to me, but sure. So naively, I agreed to go off and research it and get back to him. Three and a half months later, I was at that point where I couldn't find the statute that clearly made a person liable, uh, at least not me and uh, most people I know. And I had no, no choice in my mind except to, to resign. I had to leave the IRS because I presented uh, evidence that I had accumulated indicating that the agency was violating the law and violating people's rights. And I asked the agency for a response to my sincere concerns. And the answer I got was that they would not respond to my concerns and that they would uh, provide me with the paperwork necessary to tender my resignation. But we the People Foundation for Constitutional Education put a full page ad in the USA Today on July 7, 2000. And within the body of that ad was a $50,000 challenge for anyone that could show the law. And to me, $50,000 is a lot of money. So I went after that and did the research based on the fact that I thought, let's put this baby to bed. I'm hearing all these rumors. You know, I'm going to kill two birds with one stone. I'll answer these people's questions that are asking me. And then I'll win this $50,000. And, you know, based on the research that I did throughout the year 2000 and that I'm still doing, I have not found that law. I've asked uh, Congress, we've asked a lot of people in the IRS, the IRS commissioners, helpers. They can't answer because if they answer, the American people are going to know that this whole thing is a fraud. I was surprised to hear these highly trained and decorated IRS agents telling me there was no law requiring American citizens to file a 1040 or to pay an income tax on their labor. I haven't uh, filed an income, federal income tax return since I left. I have not filed a tax return since 1999. Approximately 67 million people don't file an income tax return. I made a decision to go to Washington so I could attend the We the People Foundation press conference. They were going to serve a class action lawsuit on the IRS signed by over 3,000 people because the IRS has refused 
to show the law that makes Americans liable to file a 1040 or to pay an income tax on their labor. I was very curious as to why the IRS refused to show the law, as it seemed such a simple thing to do. Yet I was skeptical about the Foundation's claims. There had to be a law, right? I mean, we've all been told over and over and over again that we had to pay income taxes. No answers, no taxes. No answers, no taxes. No answers, no taxes. Most people believe that the income tax system is legal and that the revenue from the tax is used in the public interest. However, there is a substantial conclusive body of evidence that proves that our income tax system represents the most pernicious form of tyranny. It is the greatest hoax ever perpetrated by government against the working men and women of America. American citizens, along with the Foundation, have been asking the IRS to specifically provide them with the, the underlying legal foundation upon which they administer and enforce the personal income tax laws in our country. At the national level, when people would attempt to contact somebody of a much higher authority, say the, cons uh, the commissioner, same kind of thing. Uh, they, wouldn't get, they would get answers that were, in effect, non-answers. There are a group of people standing outside today who uh, assert that no law requires you to pay taxes and that you will not answer their petition to the government uh, as to whether they're required to pay taxes. Are they required to pay taxes? I've been paying my taxes ever since I had my first job, and I think it, it's, a, it's a fundamental uh, construct of our nation that, that those of us who um, expect and demand the services from our government that the government provides, be they the protection of our country through the military, or be they uh, the education of our children, or be they the protection of our environment, that, that we must pay for those services. So yes, I think there is a fundamental obligation and uh, that, that it's an understood and well accepted one. Joe Bannister and I had a meeting in the White House with President Clinton's economic advisor, Jason Furman. He accepted the remonstrance for the president. On June 2nd, I called and spoke with him. His words were, we have decided that the issue of the legality of the income tax is not a high priority matter for the White House, and we will not be participating in any conference on the subject. I decided not to eat until my death, or until the government agreed to send their experts to meet with the experts from the tax honesty movement. And with the help of Congressman Bartlett, a deal was made. I'm very pleased that through these uh, several trying weeks and now months, that we have secured the uh, agreement of the IRS and the Justice Department, because some of the questions are beyond the purview of IRS, that they will both attend a uh, public symposium where these issues can be formally uh, addressed. Last Thanksgiving, DOJ and IRS notified Congressman Bartlett that they would not participate. Congressman Bartlett then waited until late January he informed me that he would not be participating. Why do you think you've been able to get away with not paying or filing your income taxes for so long? Well, first of all, I've not gotten away with anything. I'm not hiding from anyone. I'm simply asking the IRS to show me the laws that apparently require me to do these things, and they are suspiciously uh, reticent to answer questions from me, and of course there are millions of other people uh, many other organizations who have attempted to get answers. They act very suspiciously when asked to simply sit down at the table with the American people and discuss what their obligations are. Right. Rather than pulling up a chair, they pull out a club. As a matter of fact, David K. Johnston of the New York Times asked Terry Lemons of the IRS, why won't the IRS answer the questions set forth 
in the petitions from the American people. Mr. Lemon's response was, the government is answering the questions through enforcement actions in the courts. This is a very chilling remark on the government's use of brute force instead of civility and logic. The federal government itself refuses to provide the American people who are coercively being subjected to this extraction of their private property without any underlying legal justification. There is no law, there is no law that requires the average American worker in the private sector to pay a direct unapportioned tax on their labor and compensation for services. There is no law. The march will stop in front of the IRS building. They are now going to serve a class action lawsuit on the IRS. Very courageous. My name is Charles Bell, and I'm here to serve this complaint on behalf of the American people to the Internal Revenue Service. The complaint is accompanied by an affidavit that's um, um, under the hand of uh, Robert Schultz. The case was served. Uh, we'll call you with the case number. The case has been filed. We'll call you with the case number. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We appreciate your time. America, baby! Freedom! Today, effectively, the people have said to their servant government that um, that our rights are not going to be any longer denied and that we're going to have answers to our petition, our legitimate lawful petitions for redress of grievances, which are guaranteed in the First Amendment to our Constitution. So once and for all, we will get an answer. On August 31st, 2005, federal judge Emmett Sullivan ruled the government does not have to answer the American people's questions, even though it is guaranteed in the First Amendment. Our courts have made a decision that government does not have to show the law that it enforces. And the press never reported on this. Have we given this judge the authority to overrule the Constitution, the very foundation of American life? I believe that in both spirit and substance, our tax system has come to be un-American. Death and taxes may be inevitable, but unjust taxes are not. The country's taxes must be fixed, and I know what to do with it. If you think you're paying too much now, just wait till I get through with it. Now, Mr. Hanley, I'd like to ask you something. Mm -hmm. What does the government do with all the money we give them in taxes? When President Reagan was elected, one of the first things that he did was appoint a, a, a blue ribbon panel of of business people headed by Peter Grace and is commonly referred to as the Grace Commission and they their job was to research uh, all the various areas of the federal government and make a report. One of the quotes from the Grace Commission is 100 percent of what is collected is absorbed solely by interest on the federal debt. All individual income tax revenues are gone before one nickel is spent on the services taxpayers expect from government. If we pay the salaries of the congressmen and the senators, we're supporting them, aren't we? Well, yes. Yeah. Well, then why can't we list them as dependents and deduct them? <laughs> We've been brainwashed. People have been told, you know, that you need this income tax system to fund government, which is absolutely ridiculous. I mean, my question is, well, if that's true, how did we fund government from 1776 to 1913? The main purpose of the income tax is not to raise revenue, but to redistribute wealth and to control society. And a lot of people uh, might say, well, gee, if there wasn't an income tax, what would happen to education? They don't understand uh, that education is paid for, for the most part, out of state and local taxes, your property tax. People might say, well, how are we going to build and maintain our highways? If there's no money coming in to the government, we need our highways. There is a tax on every gallon of gasoline that people buy. Proceeds from the income tax do not pay for highway construction. The amount of money that we spend on defense is exactly equal to the amount of corporate income tax, which is quite legal and quite constitutional. I think we should not want the income tax for several reasons. One is that 
It is the instrument of totalitarianism. It is the means by which the government can manipulate people and put you into a condition of, of servitude. Every year you give the federal government a, a form that says, here's how all my money worked. If you lie, you could go to prison. So you're required to give them a financial statement that under you know, the force of law could put you in prison if it's not impeccable, right? And under the law, they're supposed to do the same. They're supposed to give you back a financial statement that says, here's what we did with your money, except you comply and they don't. In fiscal uh, 99, the Department of Defense had 1.1 trillion of undocumentable adjustments. The following year, they had 2.3 trillion of undocumentable adjustments. I decided to call the IRS. I spoke to Anthony Burke in media relations. He was very nice to me, and I explained to him that I was an award-winning film producer and that I was doing a documentary on the IRS. He seemed a bit stunned by this, then explained to me that Commissioner Everson, nor anybody else, would go on film to discuss the income tax. But he did say he would call me back. I thanked him for that, but I couldn't help wondering, why was the government making it so difficult for people to see the law? So I decided to bring my crew down to the IRS building to see if I could find some employees to interview. And here's what happened. I think you'd have to film it, that's it. What, what, who, 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 who are you to tell me I can't film here? What's the law? Just tell me where the law is that says that. Can you show me the law that says I can't film here? Is America a free country? I told him they couldn't film here, and he's asking nine million questions. I told him that's the federal government law. Okay. Hey. I told him he couldn't film here. He's it's telling me he's a citizen and all that. So I couldn't film him. He's saying, where's the law that says I can't film here? And I'm asking, I'm asking another question, sir. Then Homeland Security showed up because I was such a threat to Washington. You got a driver's license up? Yeah, I do. Get that away from me. After convincing Homeland Security I really wasn't Osama bin Laden, I kept wishing the IRS would allow me to interview somebody. Why wouldn't they show the law? What were they so nervous about? I began to have a frightening thought. What if it was our own government we had to be afraid of? With that disturbing thought in my mind, I went to see a group of tax experts. You can look through the statutes and look for the law that requires you to pay. And when you do that, you can't identify a law that requires the average person in America who earns a wage and works in private business to pay an income tax. The Constitution allows for two kinds of taxes. They're called direct and indirect. The federal government in the Constitution can tax almost anything, as long as it apportions the tax if it's direct. The indirect tax is a is, for example, an excise tax. I can avoid the excise tax on gasoline. I can choose to ride my bicycle. I can avoid the excise tax on tobacco. I can choose not to smoke, or I can grow my own tobacco. The income tax, which is being applied now, doesn't meet the criteria of either direct or indirect taxes. The IRS claims that in 1913, the 16th Amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, allowed the government a third form of taxation. What was the Supreme Court's ruling on that? The Supreme Court in the case of Stanton versus Baltic Mining. I mean, what could be clearer than this? The provisions of the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation. The Ruschauber case also said that the 16th Amendment did not impose any new taxes and did not change any of the taxing restrictions of the Constitution. There were also several other major Supreme Court cases in that same period from 1916 up until about 1923. Stratton Independence versus Hobart, Southern Pacific versus Lowe, Bowers versus Kerbo Empire, Burnett versus Harmel, Doyle versus Mitchell. It's actually very simple. Congress tried to enact an income tax in 1894. The Supreme Court said that's unconstitutional. When the Supreme Court says something is unconstitutional, it's unconstitutional. They tried again in 1913, and the Supreme Court said the 16th Amendment conferred no new power of taxation. So if they didn't have it then, and they didn't get it, they don't have it. 
There is no constitutional basis for a tax on the wages of Americans living and working in the 50 states of the Union. Period. End of argument. I have a letter here from Daniel Inouye's office of the United States Senate that says, based on the research performed by the Congressional Research Service, there is no provisions which specifically and unequivocally require an individual to pay an income tax. Period. End of story. There is no law, and to date, nobody has been able to show that there is a law for the average American citizen working day in and day out to pay an income tax. The definition of income in the Constitution was given in the Eisner versus McCumber case, and it turns on gains or profits that are made from some activity. Doyle versus Mitchell, 247 U.S. 179, 1918. Here's what he said. The idea of gain or increase arising from corporate activities. In other words, it doesn't mean wages, it doesn't mean dividends, it doesn't mean alimony. It means a gain or a profit arising from corporate activity. These liens that are recorded against people by the government for tax liens are nothing more than allegations. They are non-substantive. They have never been determined by a neutral third party, such as a court, to have one shred of validity. If you ever get a notice of, a, of, of an audit or anything else, the first thing you should do is a Freedom of Information Act request for records that they're using to substantiate or justify the audit. There is nothing in the Internal Revenue Code that creates any such thing as an income tax evasion or crime. There's nothing in the code that allows IRS agents to seize property. The government is involved in judicial blackmail. The government knows that if it legally seizes somebody's property, that person doesn't have the funds and he can't even get a lawyer who can help him. I conducted investigations in the uh, Title 18, the criminal code, the U.S. criminal code. And in there, the statutes and the regulations are very specific as to what's violating the statute. In the Internal Revenue Code, Title 26, there's nothing specific in there. I mean, even the FBI feared the IRS. You have to understand that an agency which will unlawfully impose a tax that doesn't exist is not going to care. If we, the people, don't know what our rights are, they're not going to tell us. If Americans just learned that the IRS was actually knowingly deceiving them, that that, enough, that would be enough for them to rise up and put a stop to it. This small booklet includes the Constitution of the United States, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. This is a document that every citizen should read. It's a document which freed an entire nation. This is the Internal Revenue Code. And this document, and it, the unlawful application of this document by the Internal Revenue Service has enslaved the nation that this document attempted to free. I was very impressed with the people in the tax honesty movement. They weren't kooks. They were highly intelligent, well-researched, and very genuine. I was wondering why I never heard about all these Supreme Court decisions in the media. So I really wanted the IRS's point of view, because to get the true story, it was imperative I hear both sides. I kept wishing Anthony Burke would call me back. He seemed like an honest man. I then proceeded to call my message machine. Hi, this message is for Aaron Russo. This is Anthony Burke at the Internal Revenue Service. Let me uh, suggest uh, some people that you might want to think about talking to. Uh, one would be Don Alexander, who's a former commissioner who's here in town in Washington. Uh, another would be Sheldon Cohen, who is uh, both a former commissioner and former uh, chief counsel. All those guys, I think, can answer your question about, you know, uh, where in the tax law it says that you have to pay taxes. Wow, good news, I thought. So I called Sheldon Cohen because he used to be the IRS commissioner. He wrote the tax code, and he was also general counsel to the IRS. He is a true expert, and I couldn't find a better person to answer my questions. He graciously agreed to my interview. The reason I'm doing this documentary is because there are many people in America today who believe that there's no law that requires them to pay an income tax or file a 1040. And there are many people going to jail for it, fighting over it. The Internal Revenue Code is authorized by the 16th Amendment. 
I think it should be clarified. I, don't, I, don't, I think government should be transparent to the people. Why doesn't the IRS commissioner sit down with them and just explain it in clear English? Why? I don't the think they really care. They don't think. I think. I think they're just playing word games. I mean, you don't you think know, they're sincere people? You no, know? I don't think they're sincere people. What does voluntary compliance mean? And why does the IRS code say it's voluntary to comply, not mandatory? That's a word euphemism we use. We we use voluntary compliance when we when we when we talk about traffic signals. Most people at two o'clock in the morning, do you stop at a red light? Yeah. Is there a cop there? Well, sometimes I don't. Well, <laughs> I do. I do. Both, and most of us do. Most of us do. Right. Um, but that's voluntary compliance. That was a complete perversion of logic. Traffic laws state that it is mandatory to stop at a red light. The IRS code says it's voluntary to comply. Mandatory and voluntary are the complete opposite of each other. Yet he wants us to believe that they mean the same thing. So can the government criminally prosecute somebody of information put on their 1040? Yes. Right, so doesn't that violate the Fifth Amendment? No. Uh, but the Fifth Amendment says I, I, I don't have to do anything that incriminates myself. Well, it doesn't incriminate you to put, to put but, your income down. But you said before I could be put in jail for it. The commissioner wants us to believe that although the IRS demands that you fill out the 1040 and you can go to jail for it, that they are not violating your Fifth Amendment rights of self-incrimination. That is absurd. Isn't it true that the word income is not defined anywhere in the Internal Revenue Code. The law says that the, the government has a right to tax income from any source derived. So, but the word income is not defined in the code. It just says income without a definition That's right. of what income is. That's right. Correct? Yeah. But there are many different kinds of taxes. Well, how can an American citizen know what income is if the code doesn't define it? If they're paying an income because tax... Because the courts have all defined it. Do you remember what constitutional attorney Edwin Vieira said? The definition of income in the Constitution was given in the Eisner versus McCumber case, and it turns on gains or profits that are made from some activity. So the Supreme Court has ruled income is not wages, it's not labor. It's gained from corporate activity. I believe that a man's labor is his private property. That's your view, but it's not the law. The Supreme Court's even said your labor is your private property. When I go to work for somebody, it's a trade. It's an even exchange. I do some work, you give me some money. In 1916, we had the Bruce Shaver case and the Stanton case. And the Bruce Shaver case and the Stanton case said that the 16th Amendment gave the government no new taxing power. I, I'm not going to argue the niceties of that with you. And it came up again in a case called Peck versus Lowe, where, where the Supreme Court said the 16th Amendment did not extend Congress's taxing power to any new or accepted subjects. In other words, if you weren't taxable before the 16th, you weren't taxable after the 16th. Today I interviewed a juror, okay, who sat on a case, and uh, they found the person not guilty for lack of filing, okay? And I asked her why they found him not guilty. And she said, because the IRS couldn't show us the law that made him liable to file a 1040. All they need to do, if there is a law, is to show us the law which, of course, they never did. And the reason they didn't do it was why? Because there is no law. Title 26 requires you to file a return. But doesn't Title 26 have to be in compliance with the Supreme Court decisions? You're going to take a 1920 case and superimpose it on the whole Internal Revenue Code that was written after it? No, that's not... I can't believe what I just heard. Rewind. <laughs> You're going to take a 1920 case and superimpose it on the whole Internal Revenue Code that was written after it? No, that's not... Remember he said earlier the Internal Revenue Code was authorized by the 16th Amendment? The Internal Revenue Code is authorized by the 16th Amendment. Remember, the Supreme Court said the 16th Amendment did not give the government any new taxing power. 
These decisions have never been overturned. Let's listen further. Can the lower courts overrule the Supreme Court? No. How are they putting people in jail today for not paying a tax on their labor when the Supreme Court said they don't have to? Well, doesn't the IRS code have to be in compliance with the Supreme Court? That's my Aaron, question. this is a waste of time. Well, let me because just... whatever I say, you're not going to believe. He's right. I don't believe him. And neither should you. He wants us to believe we should obey the IRS code, which is being enforced in violation of the many Supreme Court decisions. If no, the no, Supreme no, Court made a decision... Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I think we're finished. I'm sorry, Mr. Cohen, you're doing that. Well, I'm sorry that you, you constantly re-argue the point. You're liable because the law but, says that you're liable, but and the courts the, say the law says you're liable, and that's why you're liable. You see, he's talking about the lower courts, who are not in compliance with the Supreme Court, as they have to be. Doesn't the court have to be in compliance with the Supreme Court? The Supreme Court has so held. Where? You caught me unprepared. I'll come back. Well, no, I don't want to do that. But let, let me ask you a hypothetical question. No. You're I'm, making silly arguments here. Why is the Supreme Court decision a silly argument? Think, well, because it's inapplicable. That made my heart stop. He just said Supreme Court decisions do not apply to the IRS. That's the behavior you would expect from a totalitarian country, maybe China or Russia or Cuba, not from America. They're just making up the law as they go along. Now I knew the tax honesty movement was right. The IRS thrives on intimidation and fear, not by law. It's no different than a criminal protection racket using force to extract your money from you. Then the former IRS commissioner, now working at a prestigious Washington law firm, threatens me. Watch. Aaron, you understand Yiddish, Cornish to help. For those of you who don't understand Yiddish, that means nothing will help you. Now it all became clear. I understood why the IRS wouldn't go on camera and talk about where the law was. I understood why all the senators I called refused to be interviewed. There is no law. And now you know what our political leaders and the courts have known for decades and have tried to cover up. The United States Constitution strictly forbids a direct unapportioned tax on the wages and salaries of American citizens. The United States Supreme Court has consistently ruled that the income tax is a tax on profits and gains, not on labor and wages. On behalf of the American people, I challenge the IRS to show me a statute that allows a direct unapportioned tax on the wages and labor of the American people. And if I'm wrong, I will give my most humble apologies to the IRS. If the IRS is wrong, and there is no law, then every person who's been jailed should be let out of jail immediately, and any assets seized should be returned to their rightful owners. If this is a nation of laws and a free country, then the IRS should show the law to the American people. I felt an overwhelming need to understand why juries were finding innocent people guilty of not filing a tax return when there was no law requiring them to do so. So I went to talk to Marcy Brooks, a juror who used her common sense and did not allow the judge to rear the jury into a guilty verdict. He was being tried for four counts of not filing his income tax. Okay. And our question was, well, what is to decide? Either he did or he didn't. It never occurred to us that he might actually be innocent while at the same time not filing. In the federal government, it is not a felony not to file taxes. Finally, they said, okay, if we're going to get this guy, we're going to have to put it in the state. They called up the IRS agent. Agent Craner. Craner. Craner? Yeah. Father Craner. Mm -hmm. This is Ken Dory. He's also an investigator with the Illinois Department of Revenue. This yeah. is a request for a copy of the delegation and ability order. Right. And I talked to my boss about that, and he said that my badge is that. Badge is the authority. Hmm. And I thought it had to be in writing. The last question that the defense asked him was, did you write any of this down? 
And Agent Craner looked right at him and right at us, and he said, I never wrote anything down. And yet when we saw the video, there he was, writing notes, you know. And so I, I'm thinking, okay, at this point, the judge is supposed to say, Agent Craner, it is clear that you have committed perjury. It, it wasn't even noticed. It finally came to the climax. Mr. Harrell looked right at the prosecutor and he said, I will tell you the same thing I have told over and over again to government officials. You show me the law that requires me to file a tax return and I'll be glad to do it. And again, I asked under what is the requirement that you claim that I'm going to try to do these things. And the requirement under the regulations is what section? My question to you is, what particular act are we discussing here that I am liable to do these things if you claim I'm liable to do? And your exact question would be again? Okay, what is the section that what? But I guess I'm still not understanding your question, Mr. Mr. Harrell. <laughs> well, you must be familiar with what you, did you, that you have the police powers to enforce. Yes. The prosecutor absolutely ignored him. And he started slandering Mr. Harrell. Just started attacking his character. They're calling us tax cheats. They're calling us fanatics. They're calling us weirdos. I don't care what you call me, but I have one question. Where is the law? Show me the law. They can't let this turn into a rational debate, because if they do, they lose it. So they have to insult people and say it's frivolous. We felt like that there was an overall arrogance and that they were railroading Mr. Harrell and wanting us to participate. Judge Coogan, he looked right at us and he said, I will instruct the jury according to the law. We were sent to do deliberation. The judge promised us that he would give us the law. And we looked and we looked and it was not there. We wrote a note to the judge asking for a copy of the law. Ten minutes later, we get a note back. You have everything you need. But there was no law. And he had promised us. At, th at that point, I felt betrayed. I felt like this man promised us the law. And that's what this whole thing is about, the law. We request it. And he still denies us the law. And the reason they didn't do it was why? Because there is no law. Remember, we're talking about the Illinois state law here, okay, which is a law in Illinois. So we got out that law, and we read it several times, and I said, okay, wait, 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 you know, because they kept saying, but he, this is a law in Illinois. And I said, look at the beginning of it. It says, anyone required to file a federal income tax return is required to file an Illinois tax return. I said, if it is true that he's not required to file a federal return, then that nullifies the Illinois law. Two people, uh, they kept saying, but he's going to get by with it. And I said, what is he getting by with but his rights? If there is no law, he's not breaking a law. He's just standing on his rights. Are we going to deny him that? That's when this one juror sat back and kind of rolled his eyes and he said, you mean we don't have to pay taxes? All of a sudden we realized that this trial was much bigger and the ramifications of this trial were going to be so broad if it actually got out. I mean, it's like, it's like we had just discovered this great government secret. And so when we came out for, for the delivering of the verdict, the judge was, I'm sure, even at this point, I'm sure he still thought we would pass given guilty verdict. And the reason I say that is because of the look on his face when the first not guilty was read. His face just turned white. I mean, it's like, 
I don't believe this. The second time, you could hear people out in the audience, just in the courtroom, you know, just going, wow, you know. And the judge is just getting red in the face. I mean, he was just livid. And the judge got up and left. I sat there and I thought, this truly is a victory for the people. And I have never felt more patriotic. And I knew that we had done the right thing. I looked at that man, Mr. Harrell, and I thought, the system might not work all the time. But this time, for that man, it did. In November 2004, the government arrested former IRS criminal investigator Joe Bannister. They charged him with fraud for telling the American people the truth about the income tax laws. The jury obviously agreed with Joe. Well, it just showed Mr. Bannister to be honest and straightforward and working within the law. Vernus Kuglin, a Federal Express pilot, claimed there was no law requiring Americans to file an income tax. She also won in court. 24 people were criminally charged by the IRS because they claimed there was no law requiring them to file an income tax return. The fact is neither the judge nor the prosecutor nor the IRS could bring that statute in there because it's not in the books. The jury came back with an acquittal for everyone. When the matter is put to the test, uh, which means in terms of court and enforcement action, uh, there is a 100% success rate in shooting down these arguments. The mafia has a code, and they follow it, and it's a code of honor. But the IRS has no code of honor. Meet Judge Dawson, a federal judge presiding over the Irwin Schiff tax case, who denied Irwin the ability to prove to a jury that there was no law requiring Americans to file an income tax return. He denied Irwin the right to prove to a jury there was no law by stating, I will not allow the law in my courtroom. But the judge made sure the government never had to show the law as written by telling the jury, you must follow the law as I give it to you. Nobody can know what the law is, because the law is what the judges say the law is. The lower courts today will not allow people, in, especially in tax cases, to bring in Supreme Court decisions as their evidence. Here we have a federal judge railroading an American citizen by saying Supreme Court decisions are irrelevant. And again, nothing from the press defending our freedoms. So if you ever find yourself as a juror on a tax case, be sure to ask the judge to show you the statute written by Congress that allows the government to tax the wages of the American people. If the judge can't show you the law, then how can you possibly, in good conscience, convict someone and destroy their life? Let's see how the IRS treated one of America's greatest heroes and someone I cherished as a child. Joe Lewis was an American icon. Victorious in his first 27 fights, the Brown Bomber quickly rose to heavyweight champion of the world. His 1938 knockout of German Max Schmeling, who represented Hitler's Aryan ideal, earned him the admiration of millions of Americans. Is watching Right after Pearl Harbor was bombed, Joe had a title fight where he donated his fee to Navy War Relief. Well, 
I'm not working for nothing. I'm working for my country, and I think that's about the greatest piece of work that anybody can do. Well, I certainly agree with you for that, but you're turning over an awful lot of money. Well, uh, we all turn over a whole lot for this country this, at this time. Joe volunteered for the segregated army and defended his title while in the service, this time donating his normal fee to army relief. I've only done what any red-blood American would do. Since the checks were in Joe's name, the IRS taxed him on their full amount, even though he never saw a penny of it. At the end of the war, Joe was awarded the Legion of Merit. But what most people didn't know was that the IRS was charging him $50,000 a year in interest alone on his debt. When Joe's beloved mother died, leaving him $600, the IRS immediately seized it. They also confiscated all of his children's trust funds. Joe was forced to continue fighting until he was 37 and out of shape, just to pay off his ever-mounting debt to the IRS, which grew to $1 million, $100,000 a year just in interest. At the end of his life, Joe was forced to become a greeter at a Las Vegas hotel just to make ends meet. It was a shameful thing to see a man like him, great fighter, great human being, being humiliated and, and destroyed in this manner because, after all, when you owe Internal Revenue money, no matter what you have, they take away from you. And they took a lot away from Joe Lewis. I made a decision to drive to Virginia Beach from Washington because I had heard stories about two law-abiding families who had been brutalized by the IRS. They were falsely accused by their bookkeeper of being drug smugglers and tax cheats. And incredibly to me, without any investigation, the IRS proceeded to raid their place of business and their homes, even though they had done absolutely nothing wrong. On Saturday morning, four different raiding parties proceeded to raid four locations on a Saturday the day before Easter. I was the manager on duty and I was up in the deli and people came through the door. How many came through the door? Maybe about 15 to 20 people. 15 to 20 yeah. armed agents. With dogs, with guns. They made me get everybody, everybody in the, they went in the kitchen, they went in the deli, they went all over the whole restaurant, told, told all the customers, took forks out of their hands while they were eating their breakfast and told them they had to leave. I got the frantic call from Edie and uh, she said something wrong, something wrong. So anyway, I jump out of bed and I immediately run to the shower. I'm in the shower <clears throat> and the next thing I know I hear my son yelling, Dad! I went like this and boom, I'm slammed against the door and I fall down with a gun in my head. And they're like, where's Scotty Miller? And I'm like, Dad! That's all I'm doing is yelling, I'm scared, frightened to death. And then the next thing I hear is Mr. Miller with the, the shower curtain is jerked back. I've got a gun pointed at my head, hold it right there. The screams from the little girls uh, who were at a pajama party with my daughter. There was four little girls there with my daughter, and of course, mayhem. There were about three men in my bedroom with huge guns. He followed us and wanted to watch us get dressed and I tried to shut the door and he puts his foot in the door like he's gonna sit there and watch us change our clothes and I was like excuse me no my neighbors now are all standing out were you still naked well I, they handed me a towel at that point I had a towel wrapped around me did the towel fit no, hardly <laughs> hardly at this point I, you know they were talking about weapons and you know and, I mean it's crazy I mean, they're looking everywhere, going through all my drawers. And I, I reached for my underwear drawer to get some underwear. And they said, don't touch anything. Boom. And they go, they're, they're locking their guns up. They hold it right there. Don't move around. Don't move, move. And I'm like, whoa. I said, I'd just like to get some underwear on here, you know? I said, yeah, I got women standing here. I said, they keep everything. How did you conduct your business if the IRS took everything? We had to do it out of a shoebox so we could keep going because we requested these things. And I'm told that... The government's really not, once they do raid and so forth, they're supposed to at least let you, until you're charged with something, continue your business. This wasn't the case. They so, kept everything. So you were never even charged? Absolutely not. Charged with what? And when you speak IRS, the whole world shrivels up. The whole world gets fearful to a point where 
Let's not talk about it. I testified in front of Congress. I would like to know why this dark entity known as the IRS has come into my life and refused to leave. I raised my children with a zero tolerance for dishonesty. And now they must hear allegations that I am a major drug dealer and a tax cheat. A lot of people out there being abused and a lot of people saying, look, I'll pay it. Just go away. Just go away. When all that happened, we had to file bankruptcy. We had cars taken away from us. Um, kept my daughter from going to college. Do they ever think about the lives that they just destroyed? They think about the ruination of homes and property? No. In this case, we would have never thought this could happen to us. We've never done anything wrong. How can this happen in America when, in my case, personally, I thought that I was doing everything right. I've served my country. I've been to college. At least I've done something in my life. I got a speeding ticket one time. I paid my taxes for 40, 50 years, whatever it was. I've never been audited. What happened here? I had this really uncomfortable feeling in the pit of my stomach as I was thinking to myself, how did America transform itself from being a truly free country with a servant government where our individual rights were protected by our Constitution to being a country that talked about being free but really wasn't. The change started when the Federal Reserve came into existence and America adopted one of the major planks of the Communist Manifesto by bringing to America the Central Bank. The very same people that backed the Federal Reserve System also backed the graduated income tax, a second plank from the Communist Manifesto. You know that the Federal Reserve is a private bank and not a government agency? No, I wasn't aware of that. It's a, it's a private bank? That would scare me quite a bit. What if you learned that the Federal Reserve makes money off the taxes you pay? How would you feel about that? Angry. <laughs> like I'm feeling right now. I would feel cheated by my government. I'd be angry. It's really frustrating that we're paying money for something that isn't benefiting us in any way whatsoever. It kind of sucks. They're pretty much in control of everything. I decided to drive back to Washington to see Dr. Ron Paul. He had been a congressman for over 20 years. I had met him previously in 1998 when I was running for governor in Nevada, and I knew him to be an honest and sincere man. And I thought he'd be very helpful in letting me know what the future holds for the American people. Who owns the Federal Reserve? It's secret, and we can't find out what's happening. So, but the Congress created it, and it's not authorized in the Constitution. The government borrows money from a private corporation using the name federal that prints United States on it, and then it pays back to the Fed, which is owned by private banks. We don't know who all those private banks are. The money that the government is paying back to the private bankers is the money that comes from you and me. Why in the world would the American government borrow money and pay fees on it when it has the authority to make the money itself interest-free? The Federal Reserve is no more federal than Federal Express. I've never seen a full list of ownership for the Fed. I don't think anybody has. The government works for a private bank, and the private bank works for its owners. The true masters. People talk to me about, you know, the issue of Republican versus Democrat, as if they don't get it. And I say, look, here's the way you get it. It's organized crime. All you do is you call the Republicans the Genoveses, and you call the Democrats the Gambinos. The people at the top, they treat it like a crap game, like it's their crap game, like they're making lots of money. Occasionally, somebody at the table shoots each other, but the moment anything threatens their crap game, they all unite to protect it. They're both controlled by the same financial, economic, and corporate interests. Once the banks get into the picture and they form a partnership with the government, the government gives them the legal power now to create bank-issued money backed by the coercive power of government to require everybody to accept that, uh, bank money. In the course of the last century, they've converted this nation from a nation of independent freeholders to a nation of employees. And they're just one step away from being serfs. Most people spend the great bulk of their money for taxes, interest, and inflation. And all of that money goes to these two groups that comprise the cartel and their partner, the federal government. It's not a coincidence. So if Congress used its legal authority to shut down the Federal Reserve System, 
the American people would be much better off. Government should create, issue, and circulate all the currency. Creating and issuing money is the supreme prerogative of government and its greatest creative opportunity. Adopting these principles will save the taxpayers immense sums of interest and money will cease to be the master and become the servant of humanity. Abraham Lincoln. A young people today are conditioned from the, practically from the cradle on up to think that credit is a wonderful thing. You don't want to damage your credit. You want to do what you can so that you can go to the bank and get a good loan. There are no, no people who own their own property, who own their own houses, who own their own business, who finance their own business. They're only debtors. The average young person today has no concept that he's being drawn into a web, a trap. <coughs> like he's in the feudalist system, only he's going to like it. He's going to think, this is wonderful. I got my new red Corvette, and I'm in debt for the rest of my life, but I'm looking good. A decision was made. You know, let's get all the debt up, let's move the jobs abroad, and instead of re-engineering your skills, we're going to dumb down America, and so the middle class will disappear. Really what, uh, what most of the people in this country have become is uh, uh, food for the debt machine. When a person borrows money, it puts a noose around their neck and makes them servant to the lender, which is exactly what the Federal Reserve System is designed to do. And now our Congress, so dominated by the banks, is helping them to entrap people even further by passing new bankruptcy laws, making it more difficult for the people to declare bankruptcy and get a fresh start, while at the same time allowing the banks to charge very high rates of interest. This is the way the Democrats and Republicans, working with the banks, legally enslave the nation. Credit card industry is a huge political contributor. And unfortunately, a Can certain it be number that, of... It just seems so, uh, uh, like I say, just bald. You know, this idea that credit card industry gives a lot of money to the government so they will protect them even to the just abject uh, uh, disinterest of their own constituents. Um, well, that happens kind of a lot. The board of directors of the Federal Reserve System is chosen by the president from a list prepared by the bankers themselves. The process of finding a Greenspan replacement is ongoing and is being managed by a small group of people responsible for coming up with a list of nominees. It's important that whomever I pick uh, is viewed as an independent person from politics. If the American people ever allow the banks to control the issuance of their currency, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them will deprive the people of all property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Thomas Jefferson. So the Federal Reserve is actually an illegal entity functioning within government. It's illegal, and what we have given to this so-called agency is the authority to counterfeit money. Do you have any points of view about the Federal Reserve and how the Federal Reserve operates? They just enter something on a computer. Oh, you need 20 billion today. Here's 20 billion. But they got that out of thin air. It exactly. came out of thin air, it goes to the Treasury, the Treasury then pays the bills. So it's no different than monopoly money. The cost of living is so high today because the Federal Reserve and the Federal Government have destroyed the purchasing power of the dollar. The dollar today is actually worth about four cents despite the fact that the government, the Federal Reserve, and the media keep telling us that they're protecting the value of the dollar. This is a lie. All countries who have ever attempted to create money on thin air, the, the currency is eventually destroyed. Why did we give a monopoly of creating money out of thin air to a private corporation? The result is exactly the same as, as if someone were picking your pocket every year because that's exactly what they're doing. Originally, paper was re re a receipt which is used as evidence that the money exists. Over the years, of course, the government has disconnected the paper from the actual tangible substance, which is money. So now we have piece, a piece of paper which is evidence of nothing. nothing. In the past, people were able to take their receipts, the paper, 
to the bank and get the real money, the gold, in exchange for the receipt. This limited the amount of money that could be printed, thereby protecting the purchasing power of your savings. You don't have to worry. That's good because I work three jobs and I feel like I contribute. You work three jobs? Three jobs, yes. Uniquely American, isn't it? I mean, that is fantastic. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. Gold stands as a protector of property rights. Alan Greenspan, before he went to work for the Federal Reserve System. Now Alan Greenspan and the other central bankers want you to believe that the receipt, the paper, is the real money. This is nothing more than sleight of hand. It's a magician's trick. Because for them to maintain control over the government and the people, they have to convince you that this paper is really money. Because that is the essence of their power and our powerlessness to maintain control over our own government. What happened to the gold in Fort Knox? Nobody really knows. When I served on the Gold Commission, uh, I asked them to really, you know, do another audit. I remember it was 15 to 2, they said, we don't need to audit the gold. It's supposed to be the American, American people's gold, and so we would like an accounting to tell the American people what is there. I've been told that the Federal Reserve has taken control of the gold as collateral for the dollars they print. They list gold on their balance sheet. Well, how could the Federal Reserve, this private bank, list gold on their balance sheet? They claim they're holding that for the Treasury. So that puts private bankers in control of the American gold. If they could have taken all of America's wealth. That's a possibility. Shouldn't the Congress stand up and say, where is the American people's gold? They're not audited. They control the money of America, and it's not audited? There is no audit. Oh, wait a second. Doesn't the Federal Reserve work underneath the Congress? Congress ignores their responsibility to uh, do any oversight. The president really has no control, nor does the Congress have any control over this cartel. It just has the appearance of control. In the final analysis, the Federal Reserve bankers, with the help of the Democrats and Republicans in Congress, have swindled the American people. They have taken the true wealth of America the gold, and given us a piece of paper in return. And again, not a word from the press. These frauds are going to continue until Congress is no longer intimidated by the Federal Reserve bankers, and Congress uses their legal authority to shut down the Federal Reserve system and to stop this loss of our freedoms. Is there a law that requires people to file a 1040? Not explicitly, but uh, it's uh, certainly implied. Well, implied by force. Yeah. But is there a law? I can't cite a law, no. I cannot. But, um, you know, uh, if they think it's the law and they have all the guns, <laughs> you, you know, it's an authoritarian approach. Well, yeah, but that's, I mean, that's, it, that's authoritarianism. Yeah. That's not, that's not a country run by law. Do you think America is going deeper and deeper into becoming a police state? And if so, in what ways do you see that as a congressman? Yeah, I think we're moving in that direction because there's not much we can do without permission. The absence of a police state is that people are free and if you don't commit crimes, you can do what you want. But today, you can't open up a business, uh, you can't develop land, uh, uh, you can hardly do anything. You can't go to the bank, you, you, you can't go to the doctor without the government knowing what you're doing. Uh, and uh, they talk about medical privacy, that's gone. Financial privacy, that's gone. Uh, the right to own property, that's essentially gone. So you have to get permission from the government from almost everything. And if that is the definition of a police state, that you can't do anything unless the government gives you permission, we're well on our way. Uh, this, is, this is something that uh, people eventually, I hope, will get sick and tired of and say, you know, enough is enough. I sincerely believe the banking institutions having the issuing power of money 
are more dangerous to liberty than standing armies. Thomas Jefferson. You must understand the Federal Reserve is a cartel made up of the major banks in America, and they are the ones that are running the show, not the federal government. The powers that be behind the system, the financial interests, are able to exercise a disproportionate amount of influence on the, not only the economic structure of the country, but the political structure. This would be like the ultimate reaching of government uh, into our personal health lives, uh, which would be unbelievable. And, and not even our government, some, you know, bureaucratic, diffuse, uh, multinational, secretive government. assure the American people that, one, I've got the authority to do this. American people expect us to protect them and protect their civil liberties. I'm going to do that. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. So help me God. What happens if your, your own government is using more force and more coercion on its own citizens for the purpose of achieving its political ends? Is that government engaged in terrorism? Now let's watch the government add insult to injury to the people of New Orleans. No one will be able to be armed. We yes, will sir. take all yes, weapons. Sir. That happened today in this wealthy neighborhood where homeowners had armed themselves to protect their mansions. <laughs> Residents were handcuffed on the ground. In the end, police took their weapons but let them stay in their homes. Wasn't that kind and generous of the government to allow people to stay in their own homes? How thoughtful. Of course, they couldn't defend themselves from looters. For many of the police and guard troops, it is an uncomfortable job to do this in an American city. You never expect to do this in your own country. Walking up and down these streets, you don't, you don't want to think about the stuff that you're going to have to do. We are losing our right to property. Uh, the, the government is getting more pretext to seize it through, uh, using uh, you know, uh, the power to confiscate it with eminent domain. Uh, the asset forfeiture laws are proliferated. It's easier for the prosecutors to come in and make an accusation against you 
and confiscate your property even though they have no evidence that you've done anything wrong. Guilt or innocence doesn't really matter that much because it's very convenient for the government. Unfortunately, what is being sold to the American people today as Americanism, if you peel off the label, you find so much similarity to what we were fighting against when we were fighting communism and Nazism and fascism. The government's now putting a national ID card together and they want checkpoints. We will be carrying our papers and they have recommended there be checkpoints uh, throughout the country. Isn't that what Nazi Germany did that everybody in America was against? Checkpoints, proof, papers please? May I see your papers? May I see your papers? I don't think I have them on me. In that case we'd have to ask you to come along. Wait, it's possible that, uh, yes. Here we are. These papers expired three weeks ago. You have to come along. Halt! The new legislation, the, the National ID card is in it, it takes three or four pages to describe and it will be connected with our driver's licenses. The states will be instructed on exactly what they have to do. Social security numbers will be used. Some type of a physical proof, such as fingerprints or retinal prints, have to be on it. It is time to wake up, America. These ID cards are not about defeating terrorism, but they are all about controlling the American people. I arranged an interview with Katherine Albrecht, a leading authority on the RFID chip. Her book entitled Spy Chips is the definitive book on this subject. I wanted to find out just how dangerous these chips are to our liberties. RFID is a technology that uses tiny computer chips the size of a grain of sand or even smaller hooked up to miniature antennas to transmit information about items at a distance. Back in 1999, Procter & Gamble, Gillette, and MIT got together to find a way to commercialize this technology and make it small enough, make it efficient enough, and make it low cost enough to essentially their dream is to put one of these tiny uh, computer chips on every physical item manufactured on planet Earth. The latest technology for identifying people at the point of sale, for identifying people when they make purchases, is actually the implantable chip that you can actually embed directly into human flesh. Uh, it's a tiny glass capsule about the size of a grain of rice. It contains an RFID computer chip uh, with a coiled antenna, and it can transmit information also at a distance. Can a microscopic tag be implanted in a person's body to track his every movement. There's actual discussion about that. You will rule on that, mark my words, before your tenure is over. Homeland Security folks, uh, the Department of Defense and others have uh, expressed an interest in being able to more closely monitor the U.S. populace. And one way to do that, of course, would be being able to determine who buys what and uh, where they take those things. Radio waves can travel through walls, they can travel through wood, they can travel through the things we normally rely on to protect our privacy. Uh, for example, your purse, your backpack, your pocket, anything you're wearing or carrying. Kraft Philadelphia cream cheese has been tagged with RFID and sold to consumers, as have uh, Mach 3 razor products and other Gillette razor products, without the knowledge of the consumer. One of the tiny chips could actually even be the, the, the dot on the letter I on the back of the fine print on a package that you purchase. They were talking about having reader devices in every airport, on every bus, on every train, on every port, on every dock. One of the most worrisome applications of RFID are proposals to put them into cash, meaning that you would be able to track every banknote, where it had been, who it had been issued to, and create, in essence, an audit trail. That would, that would um, essentially take away the anonymity of cash that we now enjoy today. The ATM machine itself, as the money was, came through the, the roller device, would be, would be reading each number. And they would know who you are because, of course, you identify yourself at the bank before you take money out. And down the road, when you go to pay um, at a major retailer, it would also be possible for them, as they're putting the money into the cash drawer, to simply feed it through a little reader device. It would go in, 
it would uh, tag that number and transfer possession from Aaron Russo, say, to Walmart. Once everything you do is tied down to a single number and there is no longer the ability to pay with cash, then all it takes to render you a non-citizen is to simply turn that chip off. You will no longer be able to really participate in any function in society, including by food. So through the implementation of the Federal Reserve System, the American citizen has gone from being a private individual who had real money, gold, in his possession that was private to a citizen who has no privacy because all money is now being digitized. They can deduct whatever amount of money they want out of your digits whenever they want. They can trace you whenever they want. You'll be at their mercy. God forbid we allow this to happen in America. This is absolutely Orwellian. I mean, it's talking about Big Brother looking over your shoulder at absolutely everything you do, every purchase you make, every place you go, um, every company you interact with, all of that would be reported back potentially to the government. Hi, uh, Mary. Yes, I'd like to order. Is this Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. Thank you for calling again, sir. I share your national identification number as 610-204-9998-45-54610. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your cell phone. Are you at home? I'm just leaving work, but I'm... Oh, we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's at 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know all this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Oh, well, I'd like to order a couple of your double meat special pizzas. Sure thing. There'll be a new $20 charge for those, sir. What do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicate that you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Luckily, we have a new agreement with your national health care provider that allows us to sell you double meat pies as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Do you agree, sir? You can sign the form when we deliver, but there is a charge for processing. The total is $67 even. $67? Well, that includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through an orange zone. I live in an orange zone? Now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm. You could say $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine Combo and picked it up yourself. Comes with tofu sticks. Those are very tasty, sir. Good value, too. But I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67, then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh... But I see you checked out the budget beach bomb at the library last week. Hmm. Up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're hitting the beach, eh? It's 42 inches. Wow. Man, I'd say tofu and sprouts is, like, required. <sighs> That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, clip that and it's nineteen ninety nine even. Whoa, looks like you maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? Have we become so controlled and so ignorant about our rights that big institutions and big government can do whatever they want with us, even without our approval? I knew for certain the Founding Fathers would resist to the death what is happening in America today. And I, for one, will not accept a national ID card. And if nobody accepts a national ID card, and nobody can board a plane with that one, then let the airlines go bankrupt. And if you can't open a bank account in a big money center bank, then open an account in a small local bank. And if we can't walk into a federal building, I personally would consider that a blessing. Don't allow these institutions to dictate to us how we conduct our lives. This is America, and we have free choice. But we the people have all the power not the government. Government gets its power from us, not the other way around. Think of all the men and women who died in all our wars, fighting for freedom, not Federal Reserve bankers. Do you think they sacrificed their lives so that Americans can be chipped like a dog? So we could all have a homing device inside us? No. This ID card is the last step before they implant us. And that's precisely the reason Nobody should accept one. And you know what they're going to do? They're going to call in the propaganda machine 
the media and try and sell this as if it were in everybody's best interest. We're working on a product that we have called internally a PLD. PLD stands for Personal Locating Device, which is an implantable GPS for which our company owns a patent. The hybrid of the two of these products, being Digital Angel and Verichip, is what we call PLD. PLD should be in prototype form by the end of this year, by December of 2002, and we are already working with the Food and Drug Administration as well as legislative agencies with these products and ultimately with the PLD. We have a Florida family who are really pioneers in a brave new world. They have volunteered to be the first ever to have microchip identification devices implanted into their body. After 9-11, I was really concerned um, with the security of my family. I wouldn't mind having something planted permanently in my arm that would identify me. Talk about identification papers. Watch what happens to a woman in Florida whose license was suspended. Get out of the car or I'm going to tase you. The next street off the secret. is in the people. And to the extent that government becomes alienated from the people, does things that people don't want, power is transferred until you finally come to a police state, totalitarian state, whatever word you want to give it, where the desires of the people really have no, no consequence. They go out and they vote. doesn't make any difference which candidate they elect. Uh, I'm a programmer. I work for NASA, work for ExxonMobil, work for um, Florida Department of Transportation. Mr. Curtis, are there programs that can be used to secretly fix elections? Yes. How do you know that to be the case? Because in October of 2000, I wrote a prototype for President Congressman Tom Feeney at the company I worked for in Oviedo, Florida, that did just that. And when you say just, did just that, it would rig an election? It would flip the vote 51-49 to whoever you wanted it to go to and whichever race you wanted to win. And would that program that you designed be something that elections officials that might be on county boards of elections could detect? They'd never see it. So how would such a, such a program, a secret program that uh, fixes the election, how could it be detected? You would have to view it either in the source code or you'd have to have a receipt and then count the hard paper against the actual vote total. Other than that, you won't see it. Given the availability of such uh, vote rigging software and the testimony that has been given under oath of substantial statistical anomalies and gross dis dis differences between exit polling data and the actual tabulated results, do you have an opinion whether or not Ohio election, the Ohio election, presidential election, was hacked? Yes, I would say it was. So in other words, there's absolutely no assurance whatsoever and anything with regard to these machines. Absolutely none. Anybody who trusts electronic voting machines should have their head examined. Many of the voting machine companies are owned and operated by foreign agencies. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. 
the new world order will be built, an end run on national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault, Council on Foreign Relations. We shall have world government, whether or not we like it. The only question is whether world government will be achieved by conquest or consent. Paul Warburg. Council on Foreign Relations and architect of the Federal Reserve System. There's a group that get together internationally and they sort of play God with our money. From you this. think that's part of what George Bush said was the One World Order? They can't have a new world order uh, only with uh, you know a world police, a military. Right. I think the financial system ultimately is even more important than the guns. The central bankers of the world are working together to create a one world government, a global police state as sinister as anything George Orwell ever wrote about, where every person on the planet Earth will have an RFID chip implanted, where the bankers and the governments can monitor every transaction you make. A chip and everybody would be the universal monetary system par excellence. Uh, because there'd be no escape from it. And you'd be uh, totally under the control of those who issue the electronic impulses in that chip. Their strategies are being accomplished through the World Trade Organization, the International Monetary Fund, and the Bank for International Settlements, which is the central bank for all the central banks of the world. Most people don't have a clue that these unelected private bankers actually control the governments of the world. They have financed and profited from every war since World War I without concern for humanity. The war in Iraq is an attempt by the Federal Reserve and their partner, the Bank of England, to control the Middle East and to make it a part of the New World Order. To defend the New World Order, U.S. soldiers will have to kill and die. Arthur Schlesinger, Counselor on Foreign Relations. Military men are just dumb, stupid animals to be used as pawns in foreign policy. Henry Kissinger, Council on Foreign Relations. Now let's listen to this quote by Robert Reich, a member of President Clinton's cabinet and one of his most trusted advisors. The dirty little secret is that both houses of Congress are irrelevant. America's domestic policy is now being run by Alan Greenspan and the Federal Reserve. America's foreign policy is now being run by the International Monetary Fund. When the president decides to go to war, he no longer needs a declaration of war from Congress. Dr. Carol Quigley, professor from Georgetown University, who was also President Clinton's mentor, said in his book, Tragedy and Hope, the powers of financial capitalism had a far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. And then President Clinton's Deputy Secretary of State, Strobe Talbot, said, in the next century, nations as we know it will be obsolete all states will recognize a single global authority. All these supposed free trade agreements, NAFTA, GATT, CAFTA, are truly nothing more than the governments of the world and the central banks working together to create a one world government. They are not free trade. These treaties are government managed trade and they are destroying the American worker. Through these treaties, the bankers are actually beginning to control the laws of the world. The fact is that this relationship between the bankers, the government, and the huge multinational corporations is the very reason why the government no longer enforces its immigration laws. The bankers want a one-world government without borders, and the American government is obeying them. If the government was so worried about terrorism, why are they leaving the borders open? But at the same time, telling American citizens they need an ID card with an RFID chip, Osama bin Laden could not come over here and limit 
your rights or my rights to free speech, from search and seizure, from all of these elements in the Bill of Rights. Impossible for him to do that. They could never accomplish that on their own. But through our government, they've apparently accomplished that. Look what happened in Europe. The people that voted down the European Constitution wanted each country to stay sovereign. Yet the private central bankers are pushing the governments forward to make this Constitution happen, even though the people voted against it and clearly do not want a world government nor one European government. Now pay close attention to this quote by David Rockefeller, and you'll understand what is happening in the world today and where the American people are heading as a nation. We are grateful to the Washington Post, the New York Times, Time Magazine, and other great publications whose directors have attended our meetings and respected their promises of discretion for almost 40 years. It would have been impossible for us to develop our plan for the world if we had been subjected to the lights of publicity during those years. But now, the world is more sophisticated and prepared to march towards a world government. The supranational sovereignty of an intellectual elite and world bankers is surely preferable to the national auto-determination practiced in past centuries. David Rockefeller, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations actually believes that we would be better off if he and his bank of friends ran the world. Benito Mussolini had a great quote about fascism. He said that fascism should be called corporatism more properly because it's the perfect merger of power between the corporation and the state. That's how he defined fascism. And that's what we're seeing here. The media uh, controls the information that a person gets. In various ways, they can make sure that the average American watching the tube or reading the newspaper uh, is going to come out with a certain mindset. He's going to say, this is good, that's bad, and that's all they have to do. You look at the ownership of corporate media in this country. Who owns CBS? Viacom? Who owns NBC? GE? Who owns ABC? Disney? Americans have been taught to expect their salvation from government instead of recognizing government as, a, as the most dangerous threat they'll face in their lives. And the United States putting together a constitution now for Iraq. You know, why don't we just give them ours? I mean, think about it. It served us well for over 200 years, and we don't appear to be using it anymore, so what the hell? <laughs>
I think that the ultimate choice that's being presented to mankind is that it's time to either evolve or perish. Grow up or die. Become adults. Act like adults. Take some responsibility. I like the old idea where you could do what you thought you could do uh, and what you wanted to do as long as you didn't hurt other people.